15 years ago, the band Switchfoot released a song that has kind of haunted me over the years. It's a song I've brought up on more than one occasion. And for some reason, it likes to pop into my mind around New Year's and also my birthdays. It, it's a song that causes me to, to self-reflect. It causes me to examine my life. The title of the song is This Is Your Life. And here are some of the lyrics. Yesterday is a wrinkle on your forehead. Yesterday is a promise that you've broken. Don't close your eyes. Don't close your eyes. This is your life. And today is all you have now. Don't close your eyes. This is your life. Are you who you want to be? This is your life. Are you who you want to be? You know, one of the reasons I, I like this song so much is because it really focuses in on the core issues of life. It doesn't ask you if you ended up with the life that you wanted or the career that you dreamed of or the home or the family that you desired. No, the question focuses on you. Are you the person you want? you desire, you long to be. Circumcise, or circumcision, circumcision, circumstances, I got your attention now, right? Jeez. Circumstances aside, this is your life. Are you who you want to be. Well, chances are, for many of us, the answer to this question is no. The personality quirks are still there. The proneness to irritability and impatience still exist. More than I wish, or you wish, or we wish that they did. We've yet to grow out of those secret sins there's that broken relationship that just hasn't been able to be mended up to this point. Maybe you find yourself at times preoccupied with worry or anxiety or loneliness or grief or disappointment or the lack of contentment. So chances are that for many of us, if not all of us, we can say, no, we're not the people. I'm not the person I want to be. So I'm going to be 40 this year. And in my mind, 40 is a big one. It's always been a big one in my mind. And growing up, I thought that surely by the time I'm 40, I'll have my act together. And my character would be stronger that my pastoring ability and skills would be honed more than they are that my appetites that my cravings for things that are less than virtuous would have subsided more than they have I certainly wouldn't think that I'd be so fat <laughs> that I'd spend more days, like all day, being a much more disciplined, godly man. But the truth is, I'm quite disappointed in myself. Jeff, this is your life. Are you who you want to be? Not really. Friend, let me tell you something else. This is one of the reasons why the gospel 
is so precious. Jesus is the only person who could ever answer the question, are you who you want to be with an affirmative yes? And to say it with the utmost integrity, meaning that his standard was actually set high enough for his yes to count. And the gospel promises me and anybody else that believes it, that no matter how much of a screw up I can be at 40 years old and no matter how short I fall of God's glorious standards for me, I can also confidently say, yes, yes, I am absolutely who I want to be because through faith I have Jesus and Jesus has me. Therefore, I have everything I need in Christ. Not only do I have everything I need, I am everything I need to be in Jesus. In Christ, I stand. In Christ, I rest. Jeff, is your life, this is your life, are you who you want to be? Well, yeah. Yeah, I am. By God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ, I am all that I want, all that I need to be because in God's eyes, Jesus has made me perfect. As we learned last week, I am his beloved son, his beloved child. I am his and he is mine. Which, by the way, now frees me to admit that in and of myself, I'm a disappointment. And I mean that in a very good and healthy way. And not only only am I free to admit that I'm a disappointment, I'm now freed to work on my disappointing self without any dread, Without any fear of condemnation by God, the only person, by the way, whose opinion of me matters, I'm free to call a spade a spade in my life. I'm free to honestly look at my sins, which are the source of my disappointments that I have with myself. I'm free to look at those sins and deal with them truthfully, openly, I can stand in front of the church that I pastor and say, I'm a disappointment because of Christ and what he's made me and who I am in him. So I can look at these sins, I can deal with them truthfully, I can confess them, I can work on them, I can repent. I can become more like Christ. I don't have to pretend. Listen, it's only in light of the gospel that I can come to a text like Proverbs 3, 5, 6, 7, and 8 and deal with this text with any kind of integrity. If I don't come to this text through the lens and understanding of the gospel, hear me, I treat this text like a cartoon. Like it's fairy tale tale land like it's a fairy tale world trust in the lord with all my heart that's what it says to do do you see that trust in the lord with all your heart i can honestly admit that i've never done that a day in my life sure I can identify areas of my life where I am trusting him. Some. I I, I can think of this area over here that I tend to trust him with, but maybe not all the time. I mean, I sure do like to show my distrust from God from by ignoring what he says and taking the reins from him so he's not in control of who I am I'm in control of who I am friends this is all fruit of being a person that doesn't trust the Lord with all his heart (sighs) 
Rather than trusting God with all the areas of my life. I mean, if I'm honest and I look at myself in light of the gospel and I allow the gospel to shine lights in the dark recesses of the corners of my heart, well, man, I don't try to trust him with some of these things. I try to protect some of these things from him. Meaning, if... if if I trusted him with these things, then that would result in radical changes in my life. And I just don't know if I trust him enough with those things. At least not yet. Look, it's, it's only through the lens of the gospel that I can look at a text like this with honesty and still be confident that I am a beloved child of God. Listen, as a child of God, let me tell you something. You're free to struggle. I don't encourage you to struggle, but you are free to struggle and work on areas in your life, your disappointments, your sins, with complete honesty. Trust in the Lord with all my heart. Listen, if I don't have the promise of the gospel to assure my heart that in Christ, I have been credited perfect, wholehearted trust in God that is not my own, but has been given to me as a gift. If I don't, if I don't go into this thinking that Christ's wholehearted trust has been imputed to me, has been given to me, has been accredited to me, then I, I go into commands like this command and look at it like a fairy tale, pretending that I can do it, that I can actually do this, that I can actually fulfill this. You know, boys, don't tell your brother I said, tell this story, okay? But my youngest son, he's six years old now. I mean it, don't tell him I said this, okay? You know, he really wants to believe that he has superhuman strength. And he really wants his mom and, mom and dad to believe that he has superhuman strength too. So on Christmas morning, he's got his shirt off and he's ripping cardboard boxes apart, <laughs> repeatedly asking me, Dad, can you believe how strong I am? Dad, I have superhuman strength. And then he flexes muscles and tell me how big it is. Listen, that's cute and all. But that's a fairy tale. His arms are puny. Ripping a cardboard box is so easy, a six-year-old boy can do it. And yet... We act the exact same way when we go to our Heavenly Father pretending that we are strong enough to fully carry out things that are commanded in texts like this. And here's the most damaging aspect of looking at a text like this with a fairy tale mindset. We'll never see him for the savior that he is. We'll never worship him for the great savior that he is. As our perfect, wholehearted truster, if we think that we can do it on our own, if we pretend like we already trust him with all our heart, Father, I, I trust you with all my heart. Well, no, you don't, son. But that's okay. Because I still love you and I fully accept you. Jesus trusted in me with all his heart, so you don't have to. I accept you even though you have less than perfect trust. So all this to say 
the gospel invites us to look at this text and every text of scripture with complete, honest, humble introspection. The text of scripture, in a sense, should show us where we're failing so that we can much make much of the one who never failed. And that's not to say there isn't room for progress and encouragement, but that's not the point right now. The point is to help us from the blindness. You know, sometimes we walk through our spiritual life. You guys remember we had the eclipse? You guys remember the eclipse? You remember how everybody was running around town trying to find glasses so they could see the eclipse? Remember what you did when you put those glasses on and you weren't looking at the sun? What could you see? Not much. When we go through life thinking that we can obey in a way that honors, like, like fulfills the demands of the laws, that's like walking around through life with those eclipse glasses on. We're blind to the truth of how far we've fallen and how great he is. Listen, in Christ, you are safe. You are free to not only acknowledge the areas where you may be doing well, because we do do well. We, listen, there's progress. There's progress, and I take great courage in that. I don't want to discourage you from that. We make steps. We grow. And the gospel allows us to look at that progress and and be encouraged and and take great strength in that. But at the same time, the gospel also frees us to take a good, honest look at where we're falling short. And that's not so we can fall into some sort of morbid, self-depressing introspection. It's so that we can work on it. It's so we can grow. But we're never going to grow and give God the glory that he deserves in these areas if we don't trust the gospel enough to look at it honestly. Trust in the Lord with all your heart? Not me. I need Jesus for that one. So, with this in mind, I'd like for us to take a good, honest look at this text knowing that we are completely accepted by God through the gospel, at least those who are trusting in Christ, have saving faith in Christ. So knowing that we have that acceptance through faith in the gospel and knowing that we are free to acknowledge and confess and work on the areas where he reveals we're weak. And I'm going to tell you, the standard he puts before us today is pretty high. Very high. That first standard, that our first point is... Trust in the Lord with all your heart. That's our first point. I stole the words, obviously, straight from Scripture. In essence, God tells us to trust in Him with all our heart three times in three different ways in this passage. In verse 5, that first line of verse 5, He says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. The first line of verse 6, He says, In all your ways acknowledge Him. And there in verse 7, in the middle of verse 7, he tells us to fear the Lord. All of these are basically telling us that we are to trust in the Lord with all our heart. The fear of the Lord, it's obviously something that we've spent some time with in the last months as we've gone through the book of Proverbs. This morning, we can accurately summarize it as cognitively, at least in your mind, knowing God's word more and more, and then with the emotions, trusting God more and more. And as a result, we're going to trust and take great joy in his promises, great comfort in the gospel, but at the same time, we're going to trust and fear his promises of wrath, wrath that we're protected from as believers because Christ bore on the cross, but we also grow in this trust and fear of discipline, knowing that the Lord disciplines those he loves, something we're going to look at when we get to verse 11 of chapter 3, not this week, obviously, but here in the near future. So that's the fear of the Lord. He's telling us to trust him 
We know him th by reading his word. We trust him. We trust the promises and we trust the pro of blessing. We trust the promises of discipline. Now in verse six, that first line of verse six, when he tells us in all your ways, acknowledge him, he's inviting us there to an all out commitment to know him. The original meaning is somewhat lost here in the English word, that word acknowledge. When we acknowledge something, we, we give our assent. We give some verbal admission to the truth of the fact of the reality of something. When I think of acknowledging something, I think of somebody standing in front of a banquet and saying, we would just like a people, you know, that are at a banquet, we would just like to acknowledge all the people who made this possible, right? Is that how you use the word acknowledge? Do we need to do jumping jacks? I've threatened you to do jumping jacks before. I will, no, <laughs> not make you do jumping jacks. Or maybe somebody comes to, you bring a problem to your boss and your boss says, yeah, we acknowledge there's a problem here and we need to do something about it. Well, that's not what, God's getting at here in verse six when he says, in all your ways, acknowledge him. He doesn't simply want us to acknowledge or recognize him. He wants us to intimately know him. That word acknowledge, think personal, intimate knowledge. He wants us to intimately know him personally in our daily, moment by moment experiences of life. That's why it says in all your ways, personally know him intimately. We are to invite him, recognize him to be our constant companion, counselor, and guide designed to know him and his ways throughout our day. As we walk through our day, whether things are going well or indifferent or poorly, we are to see that he is there and he is a voice crying out a counselor, a friend, a guide. He wants us to know him every day, all day. Now the command in verse five, if verse six there isn't consuming enough, it's equally consuming here in verse five when we are called to trust in the Lord with all our heart. Trust in the Lord with all our heart. That word, that, that Hebrew word for trust, I've told you about the Hebrew language before, but the Hebrew language, it's so beautiful. It just paints pictures. These, these words are just so poetic and beautiful. This particular word for trust, it calls on us to rely on God for safe keeping, for keeping us secure, even in the face of great danger or threat. In other words, if I could use some metaphors, he, or similes, he is like a warm home and a warm bed when it's 10 below zero outside. And I looked at my wife last night and I just thought, are you not, are we not so thankful we are not homesteaders living in a leaky log cabin with drifts and wind and we're running out of firewood because I wouldn't be smart enough to cut enough. God is like our warm house on a sub-zero day. He's like that loving, protective father that, help, or that safely helps his family get across the river or the stream so nobody gets wet or drifts down the stream. He's like that unpenetrable body armor that protects against an enemy's bullets. The Lord is worthy of wholehearted trust, not only in the good times, but especially, especially in the dark times. When life is hard, when you don't know what to do, he says, trust me. Trust my ways with all your heart. Now, when you put these three 
phrases together, trust in the Lord with all your heart and all your ways acknowledge him and fear the Lord, what you end up with is a picture of a person who honors the Lord, that obeys the Lord out of this wholehearted trust in him, no matter what he calls you to be and do. It's a wholehearted commitment, a wholehearted trust to follow him no matter where life has you in your particular circumstances. If God is calling you to love the person who is hard at work, well, guess what? Then you go to work and you love the person that's hard to love. Why? Because you trust God. Even in your dealings with difficult people. If God tells you to move towards someone you've hurt or you've been hurt by, well, then what do you do? You move towards that person, seeking to live at peace with all men, as far as it depends on you. Why? Because you trust him, that he is telling you to do the good and right thing. If God calls you to stop manipulating people in situations for your own selfish game, what do you do? You trust him with your circumstances because he, after all, is sovereignly orchestrating those circumstances. If God calls you to sacrificially use your finances to further his kingdom, what do you do? You sacrificially give because you trust him with your wallet. And if God calls you to sacrifice yourself on a cross for the sins of his people, a circumstance that is so full of anguish you find yourself literally sweating blood, well then that's what you do because you trust him with all your heart. And obviously that's a reference to Christ and none of us could do that. But Christ is our example in this wholehearted trust. Speaking of Jesus' death on the cross, Peter said that when Jesus was reviled there, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but instead he continued what? Entrusting himself to God. He's sitting there trusting God on the cross. Okay, okay, Father, you know what you're doing here. Take this cup from me, but I, I don't want to do this. Take it from me, but nevertheless, not what I want, what you want. Your will be done. I trust you. Friend, in 2018, will you be a person who is willing to take a good, honest Look at what and where you're not trusting God in or for with. Will, will, you make, will you make a good, honest evaluation of ways you, can, you yourself can see yourself taking the reins, taking the power, taking the control from God in your life, and you're still kind of holding on to that power? Can you grow will you make it a commitment to grow in your trust to hand the reins back to christ because he is worthy of our trust now i'm not sure that we could ever quantify jesus's wholehearted trust in god the father but maybe we can compare jesus's trust to all the water in all the oceans, in all the world. Okay, so let's compare it to that. Jesus' trust is like all the water in all the oceans in all the world. And if that's the case, then maybe my trust in God can be compared to a five-gallon bucket of water. So the question becomes, because that five-gallon bucket isn't very satisfying, the question becomes, how can I go from having a bucket-sized trust in God to a trust the size of an ocean? How can I, how can you, how can we grow in our trust of God? Well, I want to give you a few very practical ways in which we can do this. It's going to sound so obvious, you could probably write this list right now before I even tell you. But that's okay, we're going to go through it anyways. The first way we can grow in our trust in God is it starts 
with time with God in his word. And I've, I've been very deliberate in wording it the way that I did. It's spending time with God in his word. Because as I get older, I find it's very easy for people to spend time in his word without God. It's about spending quality time with God in his word. I've been a Christian now for nearly three decades. And if that has taught me anything, it's this. It's that my trust in God and doing what he wants me to do, it's directly linked to the amount of time that I spend with him in his word. If my time in his word with him, loving him, enjoying him, learning from him, being instructed by him, if that is good, I mean, if, if it's on the rise, if it's, if it's consistent, then my trust is on par with that. The two are linked. But if I'm neglecting his word, if I... Sp I'll tell you, I'm, I'm such a pathetic human being. If I'm not spending time like hourly in his word, it has a direct effect on my trust. And instead of trusting him with these areas of my lives, I grab the reins. I lean on my own understanding. Listen, I find it next to impossible to trust him with even the smallest parts of my life, if the, the minutest parts of my life, if I am not spending quality time with him in his word, using thoughtful meditation, thoughtful reading, and I mean a lot of time. We were talking a couple of weeks ago in Sunday school about Bible reading plans, and <laughs> the joke was... <laughs> it's the beginning of the year and people try to start reading through the Bible at the beginning of the year. It's common. It's a pretty common New Year's Day, New Year's resolution. So we were talking about it and uh, people were trying to figure out what the key of the success was that was and getting through it. And the big joke was behind the scenes, I didn't know it. Was, my suggestion was that you read at least 10 chapters in the Bible a day. But before people came into the sanctuary, before they came into the class, they were like, well, she's probably going to tell us to read 10 chapters a day. <laughs> That's exactly what I said. Listen, we do not set the bar nearly high enough when it comes to our relationship with God and how much time and enjoyment is to be had there. So many of us just think, man, if I could read the daily bread a couple times a week, then I'll really be living. No, I'm going to invite you. Consume this thing. There is nothing more enjoyable, more fulfilling in life than reading his scriptures, thinking upon them, communion with God. Guys, when you wake up, when you're brushing your teeth, when you're cooking your kids breakfast, when you're driving to work, when you're at work, when you're at your lunch hour, when you're working in the afternoon, when you're driving home, when you're eating dinner, when you're sitting on the couch, when you're laying in bed, may God's presence be a reality in your life because you are dwelling in the word of God. Don't make it your New Year's resolution to get through the Bible. Make it your New Year's resolution to have the Bible get in you, get through you. There is a wonderful relationship to be had with God. And I feel like so many of us just scratch the surface with setting the bar too low. And church, I just wanna invite you to the most fulfilling, most rewarding experience in life. And that's a moment by moment relationship with your God. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And this works hand in hand with the second way that we can grow in our trust in the Lord. The first one is spend time with God in his word. The second is 
like I said, it goes hand in hand. It requires thought. It requires thought. We need to commit our thoughts to the Lord. Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 20 says, beautiful verse, whoever gives thought to the word will discover good and blessed is he who trusts in the Lord. Thoughts centered on God's word and trust, they go hand in hand. Let me read the verse for you again. Whoever gives thought to the word will discover good and he will be blessed because he trusts in the Lord. Friend, I want to invite you, do whatever it takes. Do whatever it takes to think about the Lord as much as possible throughout your day. It's not something that comes natural to many of us. I've had to set reminders on my phone. I have to put scripture on my screensaver. I really ought to put some scripture on my food cupboard before I go snacking at 10 o'clock at night. I'll do that. Do whatever it takes to make it second nature for you to dwell on the Lord and his word all day long. I know that there are some older saints in our church family that do this. They are such an encouragement. Ask them, how did you get there? Older saints, thank you for your example. Lead us, we need your help. Third, trusting the Lord requires prayer. We've got to pray. We've got to ask God to show where you need to grow in your trust in him. Ask him to reveal to you areas of your life where you're keeping him out, where you're controlling and he's and not trusting. Ask him to enable you by the power of his Holy Spirit to more and more trust him in such a way that you actually change. And let me just say this, trust with anything. Trust grows with experience. What I mean by that is, the more you step out in faith, the more you step out and trust God, his word, his direction, the more you will experience, it's good. It's faithful, he's faithful. It's just, it's like a snowball. It grows and grows and grows. You know, when we were in Nepal on that short-term mission trip this year, we had to walk across these suspension bridges. You know what a suspension bridge is? We have some here even in Billings and they're nice, stable. They got big cables and usually steel or wood boards that go across. They look strong enough to drive a car, ride a horse across. Well, in Nepal, the mountains are a little bit bigger, which means the valleys are quite a bit bigger. And you walk across these suspension bridges that you're pretty sure are not safe. <laughs> you start out walking on them, you look down. Don't recommend it, but you look down and you find out that 50, 60, 70% of the boards no longer have screws in them. <laughs> They bounce up and down like crazy. But after you go over a few of these, trying to hide your tears from your teammates because you're so afraid, you start to gain some trust in them. So much so, it becomes second nature. You come to a suspension bridge, and you walk right across it. The last suspension bridge we came across, I was so fatigued, so tired, so worn out, we had walked and walked and walked and I was doing my best to fake it like I was in shape and I could handle it. And we come to the suspension bridge and it looks to be the most dangerous over the worst valley, crevasse, whatever there is. And if it had not been for my previous experience learning to trust in those suspension bridges, there's no way I would have walked across that thing. They would have had to send a helicopter. It was crazy. I was the last one to go across and I'm so thankful because I was so scared. But experience taught me I could trust it. Church, the more you step out in faith, the more you learn to trust God or in the small things in life, the more experience you gather, 
the more trusting, the more wholehearted your trust becomes. Fourthly, I need to tell you that growing in your trust in the Lord, it requires great patience. It requires great patience, even long suffering. Here's why. Because it's easy to quit. It's easy to stop trusting, throw in the towel, especially when you look around and it seems like other people who aren't trusting the Lord, they seem to be doing just fine. And they got good jobs. They got a happy life. They seem successful. God, why do I need to trust you in all my, with all my heart and do these hard things when these people who completely ignore you seem to be doing just fine. I mean, isn't this the heart behind Asaph's question to God in Psalm 73? God, why? Why do the righteous seem to have it so hard, but the wicked seem to be having so much fun? What's God say? How does he teach Asaph? Well, in verse 18, and truly, he says, God has put them on a slippery path and will send them sliding over the cliff to destruction. In an instant, they will be destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. In other words, their life of ease and happiness and enjoying sin is nothing more than a road full of dangerous, treacherous ice that will send them sliding over a cliff into sure destruction. So don't mistake their smile for something that is good. Trusting the Lord requires great patience because there's a way that seems very joy-filled and rewarding that only leads to death. But the path of trust in the Lord, it leads to life. Christian, trusting the Lord requires great patience. Don't fall for the temptation of a life that doesn't trust in God. So that's point number one. We're gonna fly through points number two and three. If point number one, trust in the Lord, is the front of a coin, then point number two is the backside of that coin, and it is don't trust in yourself. Trust in God, don't trust in yourself. This passage teaches us this in a couple of places. In the second line of verse five, it says, do not lean on your own understanding. The first verse or uh, phrase of verse seven says, be not wise in your own eyes. And verse seven, the last part there in verse seven, it says, and turn away from evil. Again, each of these phrases are virtually synonymous, teaching the same thing, calling us not to trust in our own wisdom, but in God and his wisdom. This phrase, do not lean on your own understanding. To lean on something requires a certain amount of trust. I'm leaning on the pulpit. I'm trusting it's gonna hold me up. If I miss... I fall over. It requires, when you lean on something, trust. In verse five, God is saying, don't trust in your own natural understanding. Your understanding can be equated to a broken crutch. If you have a broken leg or two and you are relying on a broken crutch, it might get you around for a little while, but soon enough, it's going to cause you more trouble and pain. Our understanding is a broken crutch. The evil spoken about in verse 7 is the evil of being wise in your own eyes. In other words, you already know it all. <laughs> this is clarified for us in Proverbs, uh, found later on in the book. For example, Proverbs 28, 26. Whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool but he who walks in wisdom will be delivered. Do you know who, what the person looks like that's trusting in their own mind? It's the person that takes the reins from God and says, God, I've got this. You don't, I don't need to trust you here in this area of my life. I got this. That's trusting in your own understanding, your own wisdom. 
The Bible says that's, you're being a fool. You know what else it looks like? Let's take it a step farther. You know, some of us get really smart in our foolishness. We're really smart fools. Like we can have our own understanding, our way of thinking, right? And we're like, well, I'm not a fool. I'm not gonna trust in my own understanding, my own wisdom. No, I'm gonna go to somebody that thinks just like me and looks just like me and dresses just like me and believes just like me. And I'm gonna ask them for advice. That way I'll be wise. No, you just went to somebody as foolish as yourself. I'm guilty. We need to be careful of this. We could see this being played out all the time. Maybe there's a conflict at work. Somebody comes into the office or the store, or wherever you work, and you're, they were rude. They were just downright mean to you. And so you were mean back. It's so mad at that person. And you go home to your spouse. It's just as foolish as you are. Happy Christmas, Merry New Year. Or to your spouse, it's just as foolish as you are. And you say, so and so was so mean at me, to me. They're such a jerk. I hate them. I should, we need to figure out how to get them back. And your spouse is like, yeah, go get them. And not that this would ever happen. But you're going to somebody that has the same mindset as you. And the way of the fool is right in his own eyes, Proverbs 12, 15 tells us. You feel very justified and right in your position. You won't listen to God and his word for nothing. <sighs> Proverbs 26, 12. Do you see a man who is wise in his own eyes? Well, there is more hope for a fool than for him. Friend, don't lean on your own understanding. It's a broken crutch. Or to put it another way, don't trust in your five-gallon bucket full of understanding. Trust instead in the ocean of wisdom that is found in God and delivered to us through his word. So trust the Lord not yourself. And if you want to know how to apply point number two, it's the exact same way as you apply point number one. Spend time with God in his word, thought, put a lot of thought into that time, that, that incredible thoughtfulness, the prayer and the patience. And remember the spending time, that experience is what will ultimately grow your trust. Our last point for this morning from this text. It informs us of a blessing attached to when we trust God rather than ourselves. Here's the blessing. It's found at the end of verse six and all of verse eight. The end of, ver or the mid yeah, the end of verse six. He will make straight your paths. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding, and he will make straight your paths. It will be, verse eight, healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. What he's getting at is if you trust in the Lord and not in yourself, then generally speaking, you will enjoy a straight path in life, meaning that your relationships will be based on biblical ethics. You won't be crooked. And generally speaking, all things being equal, you will enjoy a healthy and refreshed life, not a life weighed down with poor choices and unwise living. Now, is God here promising a life of ease and health and success? No, he's not. But there are built-in blessings that often flow from a life that seeks to trust the Lord. Listen, I'm going to tell you right now, there's nothing worse in life than knowing what God wants you to do and you don't do it. That is an unhealthy place to be. And you know exactly what I'm talking about. There's blessings that flow from trusting in the Lord and not leaning on your own understanding. You're going to be a whole lot less anxious. One of the greatest 
fruits that show you that you do not trust in the Lord is you're anxious. You worry. You don't trust he's good. You don't trust he's in control. He doesn't, you don't trust that somehow he's going to work even this circumstance out for your good. So you're going to be less anxious. You're going to be less manipulative. You're going to be less controlling. You're going to be a whole lot more likable. You're going to be more like Jesus. Your relationships are going to be fuller and more meaningful. And literally, this text tells us that your flesh and bones will feel better. The blessings attached to these verses, they are a whole person blessing. Not dealing with just our hearts or just our minds or just our relationship with God or others. It even includes our bones. You're just healthier. Generally speaking, all things being equal. That's not a promise to not get cancer or get a cold. But generally speaking, all things being equal, the life that trusts in the Lord is rich. Cornerstone, as we begin a new year, may I invite you to consider how you can trust the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding and to do so in light of the gospel. The gospel tells us that no one trusts in the Lord with all their heart perfectly. That is, except for the Lord Jesus Christ. So don't put your confidence, don't put the assurance of your salvation based on how well you can trust in the Lord. Put your confidence in how well Jesus has trusted in the Lord. Isn't that interesting? I just told you to trust in the Lord. The gospel also frees us, church, to take a good, honest look at where we can strengthen our trust in the Lord. Where are you trusting yourself? Can you just, I know I've, I've spent too much time, you're probably bored. Just ask yourself the question. Where do you know right now you are trusting in yourself rather than God? Would you humbly consider repenting? Giving the power, giving the reins back to Christ. Trusting him. And God invites you to acknowledge these shortfalls, these sins this morning. Confess them to him. There's plenty of grace and forgiveness. And the gospel, it's gonna invite you, it does invite you to grow in your walk with God. Grow in your spiritual trust. It, or grow in your, it, grow in your walk with the Lord through, grow in your walk with the Lord. <laughs> it's gonna act like fertilizer on your trust. Tomorrow starts a new year. Will you commit to spending more of your day with God through his word? Will you commit to giving more of your thought to God and his ways? Will you commit to improving your prayer life, especially in this area? And will you pursue trusting the Lord with great patience? Let's pray.